Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Valerie Friedland. She is professor and former director of graduate studies in the Department of English at the University of Nevada in Reno. She is an expert on the relationship between language and society, or sociolinguistics, which is something we're going to talk about today. And we're going to focus on her book, like literally dude arguing for the good <laughs> in bad English. So Dr. Friedland, welcome to the show. It's a big pleasure to have you on. Thank you. And I love how you said my title. I, I want people to have a smile on their face when they say like literally dude. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I'm very used to this kind of language because, you know, I, I'm uh, weirdly, as a Portuguese person, I'm also a wrestling fan. And so there's a guy in WWE, Matt Riddle, and he's the original bro. So. <laughs> oh, perfect. Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but, okay, so, so just to set the stage and before we get into the words you go through in your book, like, literally, dude, and others. What is it that people tend to call bad English or any other bad language? Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. That's a, a very good question because a lot of times what we talk about is what's bad, but we rarely talk about what we mean by what's good. And a lot of what we think of as bad language is simply something that deviates or is noticeable to yeah. us as speakers of standard English or standard language, whatever language that may be. But if we ask someone what is standard English, it's really hard to define. And there is no clear cut definition of a standard language, particularly American English, because we don't have any kind of governing body that has set forth here is what constitutes good English. So really what bad English is, according to the people that believe in it, it's anything that deviates from what they think is acceptable sounding English. And usually this starts with groups that are disfavored in society. So marginalized ethnicity, for example, like African American English, most people call that bad English. Uh, youth culture. A lot of people associate bad English with young speakers. And um, it might be more surprising, but a lot of times we associate women with bad language. Right. I mean, perhaps what people tend to talk as being good, uh, any, any kind of language, good English, good Portuguese, is whatever is uh, prescribed or normative. I mean, normative, not socially normative perhaps, but normative in the sense of what is normative in the context of schooling, for example. I think that's what people are thinking about, but the reality is those prescriptions that we think we follow is really written speech. We don't follow yeah. them in our, our spoken language. So <laughs> right. no one writes uh, the same way they talk. And if you did, you would have no friends <laughs> because no one would want to <laughs> with you. It's not this not uh, conversational, the kind of prescriptions that we follow in writing. How many people that speak English don't ever end sentences with prepositions or don't ever split infinitives, both of which are big prescriptive rules, which have a really interesting history as to why we even have them. And it's completely based on a different language, not English. So that's a fun history, too. But the reality is this idea that we have about a prescriptive version of English does not exist in oral speech. There is standard written English, but that is very, very different than even standard spoken English. And if you ask someone to tell you the rules of standard spoken English, they try to give you the rules of standard written English which they don't follow. I mean, none of us say, with whom did you go to the party? If I said that to my teenager, she would just not even answer me because she'd think, oh my gosh, what's happened to my mother? People don't talk like that. So it's really a fallacy, this idea that we talk according to some sort of prescription that we use to guide our writing and that we learn in school. Really what standard English is in terms of our spoken conversational speech is avoiding things or features or forms that are strongly stigmatized. And really, if you avoid stigmatized forms, 
then most people think of you as a standard English speaker. And even if you use who instead of whom, even if you use walk in instead of walking, even if you end a sentence with a preposition, people don't notice those things because they're not highly stigmatized in conversational speech. But if you say, I don't got none, I ain't going, those forms are highly stigmatized and that's what we tag as bad English. And if you look at the history of those features, 99% of the time, it's because they're associated with groups that are disfavored in society, and that's why we think of them as bad English. And sometimes it's not just about the specific words we use, right? It's also uh, sometimes about the way we speak, for example, in terms of accent, right? Absolutely. And in fact, I would say that the majority of times it's about accent and not words. Words yeah. are relatively superficial because people can alter words fairly easily. Words don't come up that often. So how often do you say dude in the, in the course of your day? Well, it depends on your age group, but it's not as common. And I could probably really f work hard to get rid of dude because it's something I say fairly consciously. It's an important word. I'm not devaluing its importance. I have a whole chapter on it. But when you think about the way someone pronounces a vowel, they do that thousands of times a day. Right? You say this, the a vowel, for example, a thousand times a day in various words, but you're not aware of when you're saying it and where, when you're not, which makes it much harder to alter. Also, we have um, physiological constraints that make it harder for us to change sounds over time because you learn a certain muscular uh, sort of formation when you're a baby, and it's really hard to unlearn that and learn a new kind of a physiological positioning for sounds. So accent, I think, is probably the most noticeable thing. And in fact, my next book, which I just signed a contract to write, is on accents for that reason. All of these things, though, combine, and usually if you have an accent, you also have words and syntax that differs as well, and all of those things come together to mark you as a dialect speaker of some type. So, I mean, earlier I, I've touched a tiny bit on standardization, so how old is standardization and prescription in English? I mean, do we have any idea when exactly did it start? We have very good ideas. So uh, standardization prescription as a thought, as an ideology, is actually quite old. It dates back to antiquity. And in fact, the okay. Greeks were really the first to write a grammar. And a lot of the rules of grammar that we ascribe to today started with the Greeks. So the idea of having eight parts of speech, that was the Greeks. That was, a, I, I think it was Dionysus Thrax was the name of the Greek author of the first grammar in the second century BCE who wrote about parts of speech. And he's the one that said they're nouns and there's articles and their verbs and here's how they work. And he was the first to write this prescription of here is the best speech. So that idea of a good speech being what we should ascribe to is actually quite old. But English itself did not have prescription until it was quite old. And really, we don't find it until the 18th century because English was born as a colloquial language. It was never born as a literary or educational or religious or political or legal or medical language. It was not used in those contexts until the early modern period, which is around 1600, 1700. And it's not until it started to be used in context other than conversation among friends and lovers and adults and children that it started to become this language that people felt there should be a better version of it. And that happened in the 18th century. So English itself was a vulgar language, just like vulgar Latin was the language on the street. The Latin we know today was not the Latin people used to talk to each other. It was simply the literary language. And once you start getting a literature, which is why the Greeks started to write grammars, it then makes us feel like the written word is somehow more valuable than the spoken word, even though spoken language predates written language by some 30, 40,000 years. And people obviously did quite well in evolving without written language. But once we start having some sort of literature and some sort of literary tradition, then that often gets elevated. And we start to see those 
written norms as what we should follow in our, our conversational speech, which is really backwards because it's the conversational speech that inspired the written norms. But we start to believe in that idea of literacy as being a high, highly valued skill, and therefore it elevates the written word over the spoken. And it, that did not happen for English until the 18th century, following about 200 centuries of massive social change. So it didn't just come out of nowhere. It came because of the Industrial Revolution right, it, which really brought in a middle class, a rising middle class. It became because in the late 1400s, the invention of the printing press, which started to then produce more and more books that people, everyday people started to be able to read. So literacy started to, to take off at the, around that time. Uh, then when you start publishing books, you need some sort of literary standard. And when that was really the first time we started publishing widely in English. So William Caxton started to use the norms of London speech, which is why the norms we have today exist, be, simply because they were the norms of London at the time. So you throw all that in a mix. You've got a rising middle class and much more democracy. You have greater literacy because of that rising middle class and democracy. You have the printing press that requires we have some rules for printing. And you also have this change in society where people are starting to come to London because it's the cultural and political capital. So people are wanting those norms instead of the ones they come with. So you have massive immigration from the North and from other countries at that time into London. All of that gets put into this mix, a blender, and out comes this urge for standardization and codification. Really, it was born out of the desire to educate the masses, to become more literate, to have an institutional learning system that used English, because prior to that, you'd use French or Latin or sometimes Greek. And once you start to educate people in a language, you need some written form of that language. Once you start to have more literature and you start using that as the basis of your educational system, you need to have the grammars written. What was really interesting about the grammars of English is they were actually grammars of, of Latin. In the 18th century, the initial grammars, which were written by mainly Robert Loth and Lindley Murray, were the two big grammarians at the time, and their works formed the basis of almost all grammar texts that are used even up to today. Uh, those were written about the grammar of Latin. So they were written for English based on Latin, which if you think about it is so weird. It's like me saying, okay, I'm gonna use por Portuguese for the rules of English. It just doesn't make sense, but yet that's what was done. And in fact, the earliest, one of the earliest grammars, which was written, I think in 1574 by William Lilly, it was called Lilly's Grammar. It was a famous grammar. It was actually the King's Grammar. He adopted it uh, for the educational system at that time, which was pretty rudimentary and only for very aristocratic children. But it was written in Latin. It was the grammar of English it basically written in Latin because it was the, the grammar of Latin written for people learning English. So it's a weird idea that the, the grammar that we hold so dear as prescriptive norms today is actually the grammar of Latin and not the grammar of English. So not ending a sentence with a preposition, that's a rule because in, in, in Latin you, you wouldn't do that for the more eloquent speaker. So when it was first written in the grammar by Robert Loth in the 18th century, he didn't say you shouldn't do it. He just said it's nicer, it's more elegant to not end a sentence in a preposition because that's the preferred form in Latin. And when it goes to not splitting an infinitive, which is also one of the die hard rules of English, that's actually based on the Latin form where infinitives were one word and so you could not, you could not split them. But in English, infinitive forms are two words. It's the preposition to essentially, or it's called infinitival to, plus the verb form. So to go, to drink, to dance, that can be split, but in Latin it cannot. So you see that it's a weird mismatch of Latin rules for English. So the idea of prescription is kind of weird to begin with because it was based on a language that wasn't even English. That's all very interesting, and we're going to talk about language language change and who are actually the linguistic fashionistas, as you call them in your book. But, uh, I mean, with all of that in mind, the rules that people who wrote and write grammars sort of came up with, aren't they arbitrary, or, I mean, what goes according to their 
preferences, I guess. And I mean, the, of course, you mentioned there the big distinction between how we write and how we speak. That's a difference. But uh, uh, and of course, uh, even when it comes to speaking a particular language, I guess that in all languages, there's lots of variation. It's not that all native speakers speak exactly the same way but Absolutely. Uh, but uh, i mean isn't it mostly arbitrary or couldn't we say that Absolutely. I think what people don't understand when they start to get upset about how they feel like rules are being broken in the speech around them is that English or and all languages have a grammar that has nothing to do with the grammar that we prescribe. And, I, and that's not true. It's not nothing to do because those those rules of prescription come from watching language and then trying to write down what rules we like about it. So some of them might have some reflection in what languages tend to do. But the reality is rules exist in language for everybody, no matter what variety you're speaking, because without rules, we could not speak, and without rules, we couldn't perceive what other people were saying. There have been rules for English, there have been rules for Latin, there have been rules for Sanskrit, there were rules for Proto-Indo-European that guided speakers to be able to communicate. None of them are the rules that we write in those grammars. The rules that actually drive language are not ones that are generally available for introspection and armchair, armchair prescriptivists. So what I mean is you can't just sit there and say, huh, what's this rule? Okay, don't end the sentence with a preposition. The real rules of language are so unconscious, they, they provide us the ability to speak and the ability to unpack and decode what someone else is saying. But we're not thinking, oh, I see there's trace deletion in that rule, or there's something called C command. And so I can understand the referent of that anaphoric pronoun. These are really, really intensely cognitive processing deals that are going on under the level of excuse me, under the level of conscious awareness mm -hmm. that just drive us to speak as speakers. So a great example of this would be if I said something like, John knew Tom saw himself. How do I know who himself refers to? If I say John knew Tom saw himself, well, any speaker of English knows himself there has to refer to Tom. It cannot refer to John. John knew Tom saw himself. Well, that has to be Tom. There's no speaker of English, native speaker of English, that would not understand that because that is an underwritten, underlying rule of English, which is called C command. Now, linguists have studied this rule, and it's a very complex rule that has to do with syntactic structure, that if I ask my students to tell me why himself has to refer to John, they'll, or, sorry, has to refer to Tom, they'll tell me things like, well, because I, I know it refers to Tom. That's who it's talking about. This is very circular kind of reasoning. The reality is it has to do with the internal hierarchical structure of syntax that tells us mm -hmm. that antecedents like reflexive pronoun, I mean, antecedents for reflexive pronouns have to be in the same clause yeah. as that reflexive pronoun. And John is not in the same clause. It's in a higher clause, what a prescriptivist would call the matrix or main clause. And a reflexive cannot refer back over one clause into another. It just isn't possible. No speaker of English would do it. But if I say, John knew Tom saw him, mm -hmm. I have a whole other understanding of that sentence. And I know in that sentence, him cannot be Tom. It would be John or it would be somebody outside the sentence, right? Because right. otherwise it would have to be a reflexive pronoun. But I also know it doesn't have to be John. It can be someone outside that sentence. And that's because there is no C command relationship in that sentence. So as a syntactic analyzer, I know this. And that's what allows me to make those kinds of, of, of cognitive leaps. But as a speaker, no one can articulate that rule because you don't know that you do it. That's a rule of language. It's an unconscious rule that guides the way you talk. Another good example is no language starts a word or a syllable with an LP sound, right? But mm -hmm. many languages start words with PL sound. So I can have plain and play and ply in English. And I'm not sure if you start words with that in Portuguese, but I would hazard a guess that it's possible. But no language starts with an LP because mm -hmm. something called sonority sequencing. Again, a very complex rule. But that is a rule that guides speakers to speak correctly and to understand each other and be able to create words in their language. Those are rules that operate 100% of 
at a time for all of us. And it, there are language specific rules. So not all of them are universal. And in fact, the majority are language specific, but those are rules you never see written in grammar books, but those are the true rules of language. So when people start saying, well, there are no rules and people are going to start not being able to talk and no one can understand anybody, that's just bullshit. Because for thousands of years, for we think in, you know, language as we speak it, sort of in this kind of communication, communicative system we recognize, has been around for at least 50,000 years. And for 50,000 years, it has evolved and changed. So we have gone from some proto-languages like Indo-European that have spawned, you know, 100, 100 languages, and it has changed drastically, which has given rise to those languages. And if we can still understand each other today, then that means that everything people are complaining about leading to the demise of any language today is utter bullshit because language perseveres. It is the role of language to be communicative. It is its an entire job. It doesn't need to be pleasing to anybody's ears. It doesn't need to be uh, if it's sort of um, very complex, it can be, it's actually, its goal is to be efficient. All it needs to do is allow you to communicate. And anybody that says, oh, I can't understand what they're saying anymore because they've bastardized the language so much, simply chooses not to listen because the rules are still there. It, did, there's a huge difference between prescriptive rules, ones that we put on language, mm-hmm. and descriptive rules, ones that language has internally. And those never go away. They change, but they don't go away. And so these descriptive rules you're talking about from the perspective of, let's say, cognitive linguistics would be something similar, or at least the would be according to, I guess, the same principles of universal grammar is that it well that's a controversy i think in the field uh, that... yeah, yeah i know i know but i know but i <laughs> yes, was just trying yes, to understand but essentially, yes yes i mean that's the idea is that you know, we all languages follow universal grammar and whether you believe in the chomsky and universal grammar where we're born with this innate capacity yeah. as many linguists do or you're more of a functionalist that believe it emerges from the architecture of the brain just like any other complex learning skill yeah. the fundamental reality is either way the brain limits the potential possibilities that language can take yeah. and you will never violate those constraints because it's not possible as a speaker of human language. And also language will always evolve in ways that speakers uh, are most efficient in, which is why we often see the movement towards uh, not, I hate to use the word simplicity because people often misunderstand that to be bad, but things tend to become less complex over time rather than more complex. And what's really interesting, given the prescriptivist rally cry that English is going to the dogs is English is a perfect example of a language that has become infinitely less complex over time so that the language we're speaking today is so much more syntactically simple than the language we spoke a thousand years ago. And yet we've created vaccines and the internet and chat GPT and airplanes that can fly in the sky, all with a language that was unbelievably simplified from its earlier version. And so this idea that somehow simplicity in language is bad is just misplaced on this more fundamental belief about what simple means in society. Right. And talking about linguistic change, who are the people that are the most influential when it comes to that or that play the biggest roles? Because curiously enough, in the book, you talk a lot about uh, women and people who are uh, usually lower status, right? I think it surprises most people that linguistic yeah. change doesn't start with those in power. It doesn't yeah. start with those that have clout. It doesn't start with those that speak so-called standard English. It actually starts with those that have the least power in society. Mm. And this is true historically. We find the same patterns over and over again. Uh, it's because that though once you start codifying, once you start standardizing, once you start believing in this idea of standard language, it actually tends to hold language still. It tends to slow down the rate of change. Now, it doesn't stop change. Change will happen no matter what because people speak. And the majority of times when people are talking to each other, it's in more intimate, familiar, friend-based, colloquial context. And yeah. that's what drives language forward. So we don't go to work 
24 hours a day and speak in that higher form of language, that higher standard. We talk to each other in daily conversations and that's where change kind of creeps in. But the reality is that kind of conversation, the conversation that's not held back by standardization and codification tends to happen more in those that are less powerful in society rather than those that are more powerful because those that hold the power tend to ascribe more strongly to those uh, sort of artificial norms that codification and ideas about standard language hold still. And when you stop holding on to those norms, when you just allow language to be a language of communication and you let it be more efficient and you let those natural processes that always operate in language, that universal grammar kind of thing go, that leads to language change over time to make language more efficient. It also tends to invite um, collaboration with other dialects and invite collaboration with other languages in those contexts more so than standard speakers do. And so we have much more influence of other languages, for example, or of other dialects when we are in subcultures or minorities or disenfranchised groups or lower class groups or women as well who tend to have to do things with language that men don't have to do to get status in society and the sort of uh, like, of... like for example well a good be... example is that women historically have had less power and so they're not listened to to the same degree and when you don't get listened to we find that people do interesting things with language to try to get heard so for example we find that women historically tend to ask more questions than men well why would you ask questions because it forces an answer. So if you're not getting conversation, what do you do? You ask questions. Mm -hmm. So we find historically women ask more questions. So they tend to be more innovative in language because they've had to be more innovative. Or um, another good example is they weren't as educated and literate in early modern English because men were the ones that went to school and, and no hardly anybody except the upper upper class went to school at all. And in the upper class, it was men that went and learned things. It was men that were much more highly literate. So a really great example of how that led to a massive change in language that women introduced is in British English, in the Queen's English, or I guess it's the King's English today, we don't have post-vocalic R. So you might say, park the car in British English, where you'd say park the car in American yeah. English, right? It's a very iconic difference between American and British English. Well, interestingly enough, that happened, started happening in the early modern period, this loss of R, because R tends to weaken over time. That's just a natural articulatory process because R is very vowel-like in how it's articulated and the kind of sound it creates from a linguistic perspective. If we study R, it's much more like an, a vowel than it is like a consonant. Uh, but and it, wait, wait a minute, does that occur in every language or tends to occur yes, in every, every language? Yes, it's every language. Oh, it's okay. every language. Although R's are different in how they're formed. So some R's are stronger than others. So um, I think in Portuguese, do you have a trilled R? Uh, what what well, does it does that mean it, exactly? So is it like uh, prr, prr, or is it uh, no? That that's tap? more that that's more uh, Spanish. Spanish. Okay, I knew yeah. Spanish had one. I wasn't so so trilled R's are stronger. They're more consonant like mm. than tapped R's, which are really more like what American English has and probably Portuguese English, like um, park versus park park, and a uvular R, which is made at the back of throat, like a Parisian R, like um, mert. That's actually a really strong R. So some R's are stronger than others, but they all have this tendency to weaken over time mm -hmm. um, because of their the nature of their articulation. So this is a natural tendency, but if you are highly educated and you see an R in a book, right? You see yeah. that was written, you're going to tend to keep that R in longer than those that don't have a book to look at because it's not reinforced by this writing that you're saying, oh, look, Park has an R, I should say the R there. So what we find is R started to disappear in lower class speech and women's speech earliest in the early modern period. That's where we start to see this trend happen. So women were doing it, they weren't very literate and they often had a lot of interaction with lower class speakers because they're serving maids, they're, you know, uh, the court, the courtly assistants, a lot of times they would have interactions with lower class speakers. Also, women had intimate conversations with their children, with other women. And so the colloquial language was more their bread and butter, whereas for men, educated language, learned language, literate language was more their bread and butter. That's where they got their power from.
So it was the lower class and women that started allowing this natural tendency into their speech earlier. And then women would talk to their husbands in colloquial, intimate conversations. And that's mm -hmm. how our listeners spread. That's how we find that loss of R spread from the lower classes to women's speech and from women's speech to educated men's speech in the early modern period. And that is how Britain lost its R. So it was this really interesting tendency from this group that is disfavored in society that yes. creeps its way up into the upper class speech. And that is how changes almost always evolve. Now, there are changes that start in the upper class, but they're much more rare and they tend to be ones that already have prestige. Um, and not ones that, that sort of just creep in under the radar until everybody's saying them. But it is the pattern that we find lower classes, marginalized communities like women and children, you know, young speakers that tend to lead in change because they allow those naturally occurring changes to happen in their speech. And those changes signal intimacy and colloquialism and friendship and um, solidarity. And that becomes enviable right? Or that becomes a quality people want in their speech. So while they don't maybe understand I'm deleting R here because it's a warmer kind of relationship I'm signaling, that's what they do to gain that kind of intimacy. And then it spreads from there. Yeah. Uh, I asked you uh, more about the R sound and I asked you if, if it tends to occur in every language because uh, I mean, I'm fairly familiarized with Japanese culture, and I know that the 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 way they pronounce the R sound. Of course, they do not have have the written R because they do not use our alphabet. They have their three written language, uh, three written systems. Uh, but uh, the way they pronounce the R, it's like a mix between an R and L and a D. It's uh, like it is. Ryu, Ryu Taro, for example, in a, that's a specific name they have. So, with the, and uh, I mean, when, for example, we Westerners pronounce uh, specific words with L's and R's, I mean, it's, it's, sometimes it's hard for them to distinguish the two sounds. It is. And so I think I misunderstood that you were asking me whether the R weakening happens in every language. So every language that has R, there is an underlying tendency for those R's to okay. weaken, but not, okay. but R is actually not that frequent in world languages. Oh, so it's okay. not, it's it, not every language has an R. It would not be some of the core um, sounds that languages generally yeah. have. So it, uh, a T sound, for example, even though there are some languages without one. So, for example, Hawaiian, uh, yeah. some some dialects of Hawaiian language, uh, the original Hawaiian, not Hawaiian pidgin, do not have a T sound. They have a K sound instead. So it's not true that every language has a T, but mm -hmm. majority of languages have a T or a D sound. But not every language has an R or an L sound. Those are actually later acquired, more difficult to articulate, less frequent in world languages than sounds like T or D or M or N, which are very, very frequent. And Japanese. Japanese, in fact, doesn't really have an R. They have an, yeah. we would call it in linguistic, it's an allophonic variant that that is an R, but it doesn't really exist phonologically in that language, which means it's not yeah. part of their sound inventory. So a Japanese speaker doesn't think in R, but they think in L. And R is a version of L in Japanese. That's kind of crazy to think about, but you know how some yeah. languages have W and V that get conflated? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that usually they're an allophonic variation, which means that there are W's and V's in that language, but they're not. They're only one. They're only V yeah. in that in the head of a speaker of that language, and they have a very specific pattern. And if I'm not mistaken, the pattern for R to sound make, to make the R sound, even though it doesn't exist as an actual sound in Japanese per se, is between vowels. So an L sound, when it occurs between vowels, becomes pronounced like an R sound. Uh, I think Korean has the same rule. So it, it's they're mm. very it's a very complex kind of system. And English has allophones like that of sounds that exist in other languages but don't exist in English as part of our sound inventory that we mm. think in. But it occurs in, tar in terms of how we articulate those sounds. And that's what it is in Japanese for an R. So no, not all languages have R's. Some languages have R's but don't know they have R's in the sense that it's not a real sound for speakers of that language. And then some languages have no R at all.
Yeah, that, that's really fascinating. But I mean, earlier we were talking about uh, standardized English standardization and formal schooling. I mean, uh, do we know if uh, those sorts of things, formal schooling and having standardized languages, had any sort of specific impact in language change? I mean, did it stifle, for example, linguistic variation? It does. It does tend to stifle linguistic variation, although it doesn't eradicate it. So there is no way to stop language from changing. There just simply isn't. Um, maybe some drug they'll invent in the future that will immobilize us from making any other sounds other than ones we started with. Maybe that would be the thing, but I don't know that anybody would want it. There is no way to completely shut off change, but the way to slow it down is to standardize and codify it and to elevate it as the model by which we want to have everybody talk like, and that way you do slow down the rate of change. So if you look at the rate of change in English over its history, you'll see that the first thousand years or so of English, we had massive change. I mean, massive, hard to even imagine the level of change we had. We went from essentially a Germanic language to essentially not a Germanic language. I mean, we, we went as far from Germanic as you can imagine. We lost case, we lost grammatical gender, we lost number marking on anything but nouns, we lost weak and strong verb distinctions, we lost all these different verb classes, uh, we yeah. lost most of our pronominal system. I mean, we basically got rid of the language and turned it into this other form of language, which is much more Latinate um, in some ways. So it, we went to a completely different you know, language family, essentially. And that was because we did not have much standardization at that time in English. Once we started getting standardization in the 18th century, the last 300 years of English, the rate of change has slowed down immensely comparatively. So that's why we can understand Shakespeare to some degree, but Beowulf is completely illegible to us. We can't read Beowulf as just an everyday speaker of English. Shakespeare is painful. I mean, my kids whined about it to no end when they had to read it in ninth grade. But you can pretty much understand most of what's going on there because that was right before this period of standardization. So Shakespeare was an early modern writer. So he came before this widespread idea of grammar really came to the fore, but we were already having writing system. We were already having some conventionalization and therefore there was already this locking in of norms that were codified. And so it started to slow things down right about Shakespeare's time. So that's why we can understand Shakespeare, but we can't understand Beowulf or even Canterbury Tales. If you try to read Chaucer, pretty painful. It's really hard to understand Chaucer as a modern English speaker. That's because those were between Beowulf to Chaucer and Chaucer to Shakespeare, massive amounts of change happened to our language. But from Shakespeare to modern English, not so much. Well, this is not this has nothing to do directly with English, but I have to tell you that the hardest book that I ever read uh, translated into English was the Divine Comedy because it was originally in archaic Italian and uh, at least the version I read they were trying to translate it into how it would sound in English back then and, and I was like what am I reading here? Exactly. Well, you know, that's exactly a great example of this whole process of the last couple hundred years. It wouldn't have been a problem, but this archaic version, and then you doubled it up by archaic Italian yeah. and archaic English, and it's almost illegible to us. I mean, we really can't um, understand it. We, we find it really problematic to go back. You can understand some words, but they have weird endings on it. So in the time of Chaucer, for example, he used the new pronoun they for subjects because they is actually a new pronoun, was a new pronoun at that time. It had been borrowed in to English in the 13th century from Old Norse. It was not the original mm -hmm. pronoun for, for third person plural in Old English, but Chaucer still used the Old English pronoun for objective case or accusative case of third person plural. So he used a mix of Old Norse and Old English. <laughs> and you know, so if you don't understand either of those, right? Now we still use they, and so we recognize that. But the pronoun hem, which was 
them in Old English, we wouldn't really know what that was if you see it written in old text. Now, modern versions of Chaucer, of his Canterbury Tales, will translate it them and actually not even use the Old English pronoun. But if you see an old manuscript, it's really impossible to understand what he was talking about. Just too many things that are different between then and now. Well, probably someone who was totally proficient on and all historical forms of English was Tolkien, because, I mean, he even invented words for his book that were based in archaic uh, Germanic languages plus archaic English. I mean, the, the guy was just crazy. So. <laughs> well, more power to you for reading that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I was, uh, or I asked you about women earlier, but what does gender, generally speaking, have to do with how we speak? Well, that is a very complex question because, of course, there's a bunch of different dimensions on which gender can affect the way we speak, but it has long been an intense pressure on language change. Now, obviously, in the modern era, gender is a different word than what it would have meant 100, 200 years ago. Yeah. And we certainly see that being male or female has a huge impact on language over time. And um, it this goes back as far back in the as in the 1500s, European explorers would go to the, uh, the West Indies, and they would land on these islands where they would say, oh, the men and the women speak different languages. They don't even speak the same language. And we find this written in, in diaries from that time. Now, that's probably them being just misinformed informed about what they were actually hearing and it wasn't yeah. different languages but in a lot of indigenous languages what we find is there are male forms of words and female forms of words so if you are a male you use a certain version of that word and it may be quite different than the version of the word a female would use and this can either be the word itself is different or the endings are pretty substantially different and so to an uneducated european explorer in the 1500s who landed on the island they'd think wow you don't sound anything alike so we see that even, you know, hundreds of years ago in, in languages as diverse as, you know, West Indian indigenous languages and even European languages, that there were certain words that were male and certain words that were female, certain endings that were male and certain endings that were female, which shows us that our beliefs about what being a man is and being a woman is inf influenced what society felt men and women should talk like. So a lot of this is not biological, although there are some biological traits of male and femaleness that affect our language, but a lot of it is societal. Our beliefs about the types of things that men should talk about and the types of things that men should personify in their language and vice versa with women should actually be represented even in different words. So Japanese, even though in modern Japanese, I think it's a little different among younger speakers, but historically Japanese is one of those languages that has had different words that women use and different words that men use, recognizing some ideas about fundamental differences between men and women and the roles in society. But if we get away from society and we look at biology, there are certain things, certain facts about biology that do influence on average men and women to sound different and voice pitch for example, is a big one. Voice pitch is related to the size um, and thickness of the vocal folds in the larynx. Men on average have thicker um, and bigger vocal apparatus than women do. And this creates a lower pitch because heavier things vibrate slower and pitch is basically a vibration. That's what starts pitch. So on average, women typically have a lower pitch than men. But this is where we start to see gender as something more complex than male or female. Because if we look at people that do not ascribe to either male or female, and we look at pitch characteristics, we find that they often adopt pitch characteristics that are intermediate between average pitches for men and average pitches for women. So they are able to adopt an, a more androgynous voice pitch. Mm -hmm. So this is a really interesting combination between biology and society. And we see that the, both of those from a perspective of gender are very influential. And another great example is the way we articulate S sounds, not mm -hmm. just in English, but in most languages that have um, S sounds. S sounds are different by gender. If you have a bigger mouth, 
you're going to tend to articulate your S sound with the tongue slightly backer in your mouth than if you have a smaller mouth where the tongue will be slightly forward. So we find that women have a fronter articulation for an S sound than men who have a backer, more sh-like articulation for an S. But if you get um, sort of stereotypical ideas about gay male speech in American English, for example, a lot of people say, oh, there's a, a gay lisp. And it's related typically to the articulation of the S sound because when we do studies, we look at how people who self-describe uh, as gay, they often will articulate their S sound fronter in the mouth than men that self-describe as men and, and not quite as front as women who self-describe as women. So here's another example where we see there's a biological difference, right? The size of the mouth affects where the articulation of the S sound that's manipulated for social meaning depending on what your gender identity is. So there's all sorts of really cool ways that gender interacts with language. But in another realm, when we get away from particular sounds, for example, uh, we find that historically women tend to be more innovative than in language and men tend not to be. So men innovate, but they innovate in ways that pick up on things that already have stigma or not prestige. So a lot of times in Western culture, we find that young men innovate in ways that are picking up some sort of feature from another group that has some sort of social prestige, but maybe not standard prestige. So African-American English is a great example in hip hop music and rap music. Mm -hmm. Young men in particularly American and British culture really tend to adopt hip hop features in their speech at a much higher rate than women do. Women, on the other hand, introduce completely innovative features. They do completely new things. And most of the new things that women do end up becoming the standard things that we do later. So a good example of this historically would be uh, pronouns like the you pronoun. When you think, look back in the history of English, you is a very weird history because you is a pronoun that in old English was accusist, accusative plural. So you would only use it in object position. So after a verb, like I know you, yeah. right? It would be, if, it, if you would have been, and that meant I know more than one person. In old English, you only meant groups of people. Oh, and it, not even was, it people. was always plural. Always plural, right? Okay. And, and in fact, in Old English, it had to be even more than two people because Old English had dual pronoun case. So yit, if I said, I know yit, that meant I know two, you, you two. Oh. But if I say, I know you, that meant more than two people. So it had mm. to be three or more. So it was very complex yeah. in Old English and it could only be used in object position. But by the 1600s, you was starting to get used in subject position for singular subjects. And when we look at records of diaries and letters written by people in the early modern period, it was women that started using you in the subject case for singular before other people. So this is a place where they started being innovative, um, probably because you and ye conflated in how they were pronounced in colloquial speech. So just like we say today, yeah, I know ya, I know ya. Well, ya yeah and ye don't sound all that different. And so that led to confusion of, huh, is that a ye there or are you there? Is it, you know, so we don't know which one it really should be. Kind of like people in modern English say, um, him and I, him and I were going, or me and him, where they start mm -hmm. to use the object case and subject because they're confused about which one it should be. That seems to be what happened in early modern English. And it was primarily women that did that, probably because they were less literate. So they weren't as tied to the book reading of which one should go there. They used mainly conversational speech where ye and you fell in together in the pronunciation. Yeah. And they adopted you as a subject. And guess what? Everybody followed them. And now we all say you for singulars and subjects and for singulars and objects. And so that's a great example of women leading a change and being innovative. And we find that pattern over and over and over in history where women create new forms, often from existing forms, but sometimes out of nowhere, they'll change things up. And those forms end up becoming what's standard 50 years later. So there's huge differences by gender and they're on all different levels from the way we sound based on biology to the way we adopt new changes based on social norms. So it's just really crazy the extent to which gender affects our speech. That's really interesting. So would one of the reasons behind the fact that 
lower status people and women and of course throughout history unfortunately women have also been generally lower status um, uh, they contribute more to linguistic innovation does it have anything to do with the fact that uh, more educated people tend to be more linguistically rigid as well I think in the early modern period that absolutely explained women's innovation, that women were both in society, but also not allowed in all aspects of society, like the literate educated areas. And that yeah. certainly did cause change, but that wouldn't explain today where we find the same pattern at work. So even in modern English, when we look at who leads in linguistic change, it is still women, and if we look at the statistics on education, women are actually generally more educated than men in today's society. Yeah, that's so, true. So even though, yes, I think that did really start the ball rolling um, in older forms of English, it would not explain why it is also a true of a pattern today. And that is really a big question in linguistics. Why are women so innovative linguistically? And I think there are a number of different theories of, as to why um, we tend to still find the same pattern without this lack of education that really probably helped propel change more early in earlier periods. And there are a couple different theories. One is that women are mothers and mothers are still primary caregivers and have been historically. Mm -hmm. And that women then are more sensitive to innovations in language that might help their progeny thrive. And so that they're more uh, sensitive to incoming forms in language and that they want to give their children the most up-to-date forms and so that they're actually more sensitive to incoming linguistic norms and they tend to be more innovative in language in ways that I guess in a Darwinian kind of view would give their child an advantage. Mm -hmm. So that's one theory. Another theory is that women because of their situation historically and in present day as being less powerful socially uh, so that they can't get economic power to the same degree that men can. They can't get mm. political power to the same degree that men can. And they can't get domestic power to the same degree that men can. And that's still mm. true today, even as it was in the early modern period, that women are also more aware of the social capital that can be afforded by language. So while men get power from economics and political kinds of social power, women get their social power from identity formation and that can be fashion clothes clothes give women power right being fashionable but also language being fashionable as language can give social capital so that's another idea that it's also that it's some for, it's a form of social capital that is more appropriate and accepted for women to wield than what men have available to them, which is, you know, economic power, political power, social power. So there are, those are two of the leading theories about why women today uh, are more sensitive. And we do have a few studies that show that women are actually better at hearing very subtle distinctions than men, which would indicate this sort of idea that they're more attuned to things that might give them and their children a social advantage. So why is it that we use field pauses. I mean, why is it that we use things like mm, uh, and those kinds of things? I mean, does it have anything to do with laziness, with being slow in talking, or with having low language proficiency or anything like that? That's certainly a widespread belief that people that use filled pauses don't know what they're talking about. And I think it's true that sometimes people do fall on it as something that they're doing when they're, um, they're a little bit unprepared in public mm -hmm. speaking s areas where we expect yeah. them to have been practiced. So when someone's giving a speech, we are surprised when they use a lot of um and uh because that indicates to us that they don't know their material that well. And certainly that might be true because what we find is um and uh are not lazy or sloppy, but they do seem to be tied to speech planning. And when you are working on what you're going to say, when your brain is is doing the syntactic construction, so it's building the sentence, or your brain is choosing among word options, so it's going in its little circuitry and it's trying to figure out whether it's going to call something vermilion or red, for example, then that is when we seem to find uh, an um to be more 
common. So in conversational speech, what it signals when someone's using an um and or uh is actually they're doing more complex cognitive processing. So we find that um and uh tend to occur before more complex tasks rather than simple tasks. So someone uses more difficult words, less familiar words, less common words, more abstract words. When we do studies that compare those words to less less abstract, more concrete words, common everyday familiar words, um, frequent words, we find that the more difficult words tend to encourage um and uh, which means someone's actually doing really deep thinking for you. So that's when we use them a lot in conversational speech. But when we hear someone give a, a speech that we expect them to have practiced, then what that signals to us is that they have not practiced well enough, right? They don't know what they're saying to the degree that we'd expect someone in public speaking to know. And I think that's why they get such a bad rap is we've taken this idea of public speaking and we've put it on conversational speech, which is really not fair because in conversational speech, we expect someone to build the Senate structure as we're talking. We mm -hmm. expect them to come up with the words as we're talking and using um and or uh there means they're using more complex abstract words. But when we're looking at someone give a presentation that we expect they've already written and practiced, or we're listening to someone give a speech that we expect they've already written and practiced, then we might judge them for using those because we think they haven't done the work. And that bothers us. But what happens is we're conflating two different settings and we're using our judgment of public speaking for our judgment of everyday speaking. And that's not really fair. Uh, but uh, uh, also, apart from that, is it that they serve uh, specific functions in conversational speaking? I mean, uh, by using uh, or, uh, or, or something like that, are we also signaling uh, something important to the other person? Absolutely. What's really interesting when we look at research on the use of um and uh, not only do they signal that a speaker is doing speech planning and using more difficult words or constructing difficult syntax, it also seems to serve a communicative function. So when I um or uh, what I'm signaling to you as the listener is that I need a minute. I'm not done with my speaking turn. So it's essentially a communicative flag that says, Hey, I'm not done here. Don't jump in because the problem with the silent pause is that in conversational speech, a silence indicates someone's done with their turn. And mm -hmm. that means, okay, the floor is open for you to jump in. And as a speaker, if I'm not done, I don't want you jumping in on my turn because I'm not done with what I'm saying. And right. so if I uh or um, what that communicates to a listener is I'm going to continue. I just need a minute. What's really fascinating when we look at large scale, scale studies of um and uh and when they occur, what we find is that speakers use an uh when they just need a short delay. So that indicates communicatively, I'm coming right back. I'm just taking a second. But when they um, what we find is the silence that follows an um tends to be longer, which means that they are actually signaling by using um there, they're going to take a longer delay. So it's very communicative. It doesn't just signal I'm taking a, a delay. It signals exactly how long of a de delay my listener should expect. And because of its role in signaling cognitive processing, that it's usually an indicator that I'm doing something hard cognitively, the other real, really fascinating benefit to listeners is it seems to actually help listeners process and integrate what I'm saying better because it signals to them that new information or more difficult information is coming. Since I'm eyeing and eyeing, that means that you should be thinking harder about what I'm about to say. And in fact, we find that that's the result. Listeners actually devote more cognitive resources to understanding what's coming after an uh or an um than they do when an um or uh is not present, which also has the side benefit of if we test them later, they seem to do better on memory tasks. So its benefit to listeners is pretty amazing, actually, for something that we hate so much. Right. Uh, and what about uh, like, to get into one of the words you use in the title of your book, because like, it seems like people are like using like a lot, like nowadays, so what's the deal with it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, no one likes like. What's funny is when I was writing this book, what the idea was that every chapter would take up one of those speech features that we love to hate. And like was actually the speech feature that 
inspired me to write the book because so many people came up to me after hearing me give a talk or in my classes to tell me how much they hated like and why do people use like that was probably the number one question people asked me why do young people use like so much and like is fascinating because people think it means nothing right people often tell me it's a it's a meaningless word it means you don't know what you're talking about it means it's a filler it's a filler word it means nothing but if you actually analyze like scientifically and you look at where does it appear and how does it function, what you find is it is not useless at all. The useless filler word function of like is actually its least frequent use. Uh, when you look at how it tends to be employed, it tends to be employed as an approximator. So instead of the word about, so that would be something such as he was like five or six. And if I said that in a different way, I would say he was about five or six. So there it's a one-to-one -one substitution for another mm -hmm. word that has meaning. No one would say about is meaningless, but yet we call like meaningless used in exactly the same context. The big difference there is age. Young speakers use like in context that older speakers would use about. So it's really just linguistic curmudgeon list that makes us um, not like that. The other like that's the most widespread and fastest growing form of new like is quotative like and that's where it's used instead of the verb to say so instead of saying something like he said he's not going to the party i i would say he was like i'm not going to the party and i was like yeah i think you should right where it's used in a one-to-one -one substitution for the verb to say and again the big big difference there is age older speakers tend to say say in that context younger speakers tend to use like but what's interesting in that use is like add something that say doesn't allow us to do. When I tell you what someone said, the information I'm communicating to you is this is a verbatim quote of what was said. When I use the word like, what it allows me to do is tell you what they were thinking or what I was thinking or um, even that it was ver not verbatim, but it's sort of an estimate of what was said, which the verb to say doesn't allow. And that seems to be what inspired the growth of like in that context is in the last 50 years or so, when we tell stories or relay events, instead of just telling the story, what has really changed in our narrative style is that we want to add our subjective take on how it happened, or we mm -hmm. want to share what I was thinking while that was happening, or what they were thinking while it was happening, which is really something novel. We didn't do that 50 years ago. But once you have that kind of desire to add this processing, like here's where my head was at when this was happening, say doesn't allow you to do that, but like does. So if I said, well, I was like, I don't, I can't believe this is happening. What that communicates to a listener is not that you were actually saying that, but that was mm -hmm. what you were thinking when the event you're describing unfolded. So you may not like like in that context, you may think it's uncertain and wishy-washy, but the reality is it actually adds a function that say doesn't have. So it's a novel innovation that's actually quite brilliant if you think about it. And what about other discourse markers? I think we could call them like, uh, you know, I mean, so, because uh, we hear people using them all the time, some people more than others. So are they meaningless in any way or do they also serve a purpose, linguistically speaking? I think why people say they're meaningless is because they're not strictly semantic. And what I mean by semantic is they don't contribute direct meaning to a sentence. So if I say something such as, I ate eggs and ham for breakfast, mm -hmm. right? Each word there contributes to that meaning you're taking away of that sentence. But if I say, so I ate eggs and ham for breakfast, the meaning is essentially the same as what I just said, but I've added something else. And mm -hmm. what that little so adds is not direct meaning that I'm communicating, but it's adding some meaning about how what I'm saying relates to some relationship we have or some previous conversation we've had or what I'm planning or intending as a speaker, that phrase that follows to do in terms of our conversational cohesion. So the, these are basically cohesion and signposting and listenership markers that add something to the meaning, but they don't add semantic meaning. And that's why I think they get called meaningless. And people like them in conversation because they help us provide conversational glue. They help us not come across as robotic and unfriendly. Mm -hmm. They're more sociable. But for some reason, we also dislike them 
because we feel like they are unnecessary and meaningless. But if you ever have a conversation with someone that doesn't use them, you don't like them. They don't come across sociably. And if we look at communication research studies that study when you use them and when you don't, we find that listeners don't receive speakers as well on likability and sociability scales when they don't use discourse markers. I think the problem is when they're ones that get used more often, um, like so, so has become something people use a lot and maybe they wasn't used quite so much previously. We notice it and then we notice it every time someone does it and that starts to irritate us. So people that don't use so all that often find that people that use so at the beginning of sentences now to do it excessively. I'm not one that personally agrees with that. I think that we are doing it for sociability reasons we're doing for conversational coherence. And when I use so at the beginning of a sentence, what it usually signals is that what I'm going to say uh, has a ba is a backstory to something you asked me, but not the direct information you asked me, but it's something I feel is necessary for you to know before I tell you what you asked about. So it's called the backstory so, that's what we call it. <laughs> Uh, and, and so it's basically serving a purpose of signaling to you my intentions. Yeah. Uh, and you know is inviting inference of a listener. And I think one of the reasons people really dislike you know, you hear a lot of complaints about you know, is because it's expecting the listener to do work. I mean does the same thing. So when I say I mean, I really don't think this, or I went, I went there, you know, and then I did this. Both of those require the listener to make an inference, which requires work on the part of the listener, and some listeners don't like that obligation. They don't want to feel like they're being forced to agree or do this infer inferring, come up with the inference that the speaker is expecting them to have. And so I think that's where people start to get irritated at the use of those. But really, that's a listener problem, not a speaker problem. It basically means you don't really agree with where I'm going with this, and so I'm not happy with that. But you would feel that way whether or not I used a you know, uh, because you're disagreeing with where I'm taking you. So, you know, I think it's really just a matter of, of our preferences, again, in that context. Okay, so what about dude? then <laughs> where does it come from and how is it actually used today well dude is a really interesting one because it's a lot older than people think you know when i say dude what's up there's an image that you get with the dude and and particularly young men dude each other a lot i think women now dude a lot of my female students in the age range you know of 20 or so they tell me that they dude each other they say dude to each other so it's not just men anymore but historically we thought of dudes as being men and if you've ever seen uh, uh, the big probably, Lebowski, yeah i was yes, just about yes, to talk that's about that's it right everybody yeah. that's the word that's the movie that comes to mind when yeah. everybody thinks of the dude right Right, the dude abides, and uh, Jeff Bridges in that movie is the is the dude, yeah, and that's for that pot yeah. smoking kind of slacker, laid back, kind of not working, you know, very yeah. usefully kind of person. That's the image of the dude, and young men use it with each other to kind of signal this sort of chill, laid back solidarity, like dude, whatever, you know, I don't care, you don't care, we don't care together that kind of, you know, coolness, it has a cool solidarity kind of feel to it. And so, but it's definitely counterculture, right? It's not, you don't, you're not thinking of the man in the business suit when you're thinking of a dude. But what's really interesting is if you go back a hundred years, when we first start to see the dude come up in conversation, so in the late 1800s, dude meant something completely different than it meant today. And in fact, today, if you call someone dude, they usually like it. You know, my son, I have a 17 year old, he calls his friends dude all the time and no one gets offended. Everybody thinks, yeah, dude, okay, dude. It's a lot of dude going around with a 17 year old. But if they had done that back in the 1880s, they actually would have been challenged to a duel or sued for defamation because dude was only used in mockery or ridicule because basically dude was calling someone an effeminate dandy. It was calling someone out as being not masculine and not manly and in fact an, a disgrace to masculinity. And we find it mainly used at the time with young, self-absorbed, self-affected, wealthy men who were overly concerned with the way they looked. So they were the kind in the 1880s that used to draw, you know, uh, 
birthmarks on their faces or little, mm. you know, little dots to be mm. powder their wigs and wear really tight vests and it's, it's a little, the little short pants and the big hats. In fact, if you see pictures of dudes from that era, they always have these big showy hats. So they were very concerned with fashion. They were often involved with the aesthetics movement. Uh, Oscar Wilde wasn't a dude because he was British, but he was often called an imported dude because that was the model to which young dudes aspired. And what we find is people use dude only as an insult at that period, in that period. Mm. And to be called a dude was really to be called out as being non-masculine and not and sort of in violation of the norms of the late 1800s. And this probably came about because at that time in the late 1800s, near the turn of the century, there was a rising visibility of gay homosexuality, of, of male homosexuality. Oscar Wilde was a good example of that. But also women were arguing for equal rights. They wanted to get the vote. So the idea of what masculinity was, was under assault. And so people, men, young men that didn't seem to uphold the norms for masculinity of that era were considered dudes. And if you look at words in British English at the time, uh, it seems to have come from doodle, the word doodle. So there was a word in British English that basically meant a dandy or a fop. That was yeah. fop doodle right, was a fop doodle. And then when we hear the song Yankee Doodle Dandy, that's actually what gave rise to the word the dude because doodle and dandy fused together and they started calling people duties. And duty became shortened to dude and that's actually the origin of the word dude, we think. So really being a dude is not cool at all back in the 1800s, but it starts to fall away from this sort of masculine insult around the turn of the century where it starts to be used for just anybody that has a really kind of cool, fashy, showy attire. And a lot of times this could be like a, a policeman that had just started a new policeman who was showing up for work on the first day with his really ironed and pressed uniform. So he looked like a dude. Someone would call him a dude or a conductor on a train in his very fancy uniform would be called a dude. And then by the, and this is where the word dude ranch comes from. It's really from these Easterners from the East Coast showing up on dude ranches in the West that they were overdressed for. So they'd show up in their three-piece suits on a ranch and they were called dudes. And so dude ranches became these ranches that these dudes from the East Coast would come and hang out and pretend to be a cowboy for a while. And that's the word dude ranch. That's where it came from. So that was like a 1920s, 1930s term. But around the 1930s, we start to see the zoot suit era and zoot suitors, which were mainly uh, people from marginalized communities, lower working class speakers, but a lot of African Americans and Mexican American pachuchos, they formed the underclass in these urban cities and they used the zoot suit as a symbol of cultural rebellion, sort of a statement of we are standing up and we're standing out. And so they were treated by cities as evil, as um, subversive, as dangerous. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting is these zoot suitors called each other dudes. They called each other dudes to basically signify solidarity, to signify this outfit that was defining of who they were and that they looked sharp. They were sharp dressers. So you're a dude, man. So they would be like, dude, come here. And that is where dude started to be cool because it started to be associated with this counterculture, edgy, sort of um, marginalized uh, affect. And that's where it got adopted into surfer and druggy subculture because it was taking over this cool sort of ex living outside the mainstream kind of vibe. And that's when everybody started to be a dude and dudes were cool. So it's really this transition from the 1930s to the 1970s where dudes went from being effeminate dandies to cool laid back macho dudes. And that's how we get the dude today. And that's, I think, a great example of how the meanings of words change all the time. And I mean, I always get into discussions with with the people I like to call purists, the ones that think that if you want to say something or mean something, you have to use a specific word because that's the only word that has that meaning and it only was has one specific meaning and... I mean, that's totally not true. 
Right. It just doesn't follow the way that language works. And I hear that all the time. I can't tell you how many emails I get where people are writing to me and telling me, I don't agree that like is useful. It it means nothing. It's meaningless. It, it's, it takes away from the original meaning of the word. Now we don't know what someone means anymore. That's not true. Rarely do we actually have conversations with someone that we don't understand the meaning of words. I don't know where we get this idea that language is supposed to be fixed because that is the antithesis of what language is supposed to be. Language is fluid and it's that fluidity that allows us to communicate as speakers. We use metaphorical extensions of language all the time. Almost every word in modern English is a metaphorical extension of what it meant originally. Like think about the word dog. I, I love to bring this example up because no one complains about dog, right? How many people do you hear say, oh, dog is meaningless. No one complains about dog, but think of all the uses for dog we have. We have the word dog, the four footed creature that we have in our homes, but we also call our feet dogs, right? So young people call their feet dogs. And then we also call hot dogs dogs because they look like dogs, but you can dog somebody, which means you follow them too closely. You can be a dog, which means you're a scoundrel, right? And you can call someone a dog because they're unattractive. But do people get confused by the word dog? No, because we use dog in context. And then I understand. And speaking of which, can you hear my dog? He just uh, <laughs> Yes, I can. <laughs> that was perfect punctuation of our conversation about dog. See, he, he came in on cue. Um, so, you know, the idea that people are confused by what other people say, they're only confused if you refuse to listen. And that's what's happening is that speakers who don't like these forms refuse to listen and that's why they don't understand. But there are so many things in language that are tied to context and not don't have a fixed meaning and that's what gives language its power. So think about words like here. What does here mean? It means nothing. It means nothing. It only means something in a specific context about a specific thing. Right. Or I, what does I mean? Well, I can be anybody. All of us can be I. So it can't have a fixed meaning because I changes depending on who's saying it. Or you, or they, or here, or there, or in, or out. It's all relative, right? Language is relative, and we forget that. When we complain about a new word being relative, we forget how many other relative words we already used and accept just fine. What we're really complaining about is the speakers that innovate because they tend to be marginalized or less socially powerful, and we're complaining about novelty because it's not native to our own dialect, and that can cause us some problems, and it's expecting us to do work. So the reality is when we complain about that, we're complaining about completely different things than we think we're complaining about. And interestingly enough, when it's people of high status or someone who becomes high status over time, like Shakespeare, completely inventing new words, then that's perfectly fine. No one perfectly complains fine. about that. <laughs> Absolutely. And Shakespeare, right, half of his plays were new words or weird combinations of words that existed previously. Or a lot of times he would take nouns and make them verbs. So a lot of people complain about how young people do that all the time. So, you know, for example, my daughter always says, adulting is so hard, right? <laughs> Where she takes a noun, adult, and makes it into a verb. And yeah. in addition to taking a noun and making it into a verb, there are other additional aspects of meaning that then could put on that. Well, Shakespeare did that all the time. He said, I think it was in Richard the Third, grace me no grace, uncle me no uncle, right? That's taking nouns and making them verbs. And that was novel at the time. So it really is funny how we, we forget about this fact that we do this all the time in our language and that some people we think of as great writers um, who were very contributory to English literary tradition did this way more than any young people do today. And they're considered and lauded, considered great and lauded for it. But yet a young speaker does it and we don't like it so much. Yeah, the artists can be avant-garde, but the lower status people can just be sloppy. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Exactly. They're just sloppy. That's exactly how we call it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But talking about words changing meaning all the time, we have literally to talk about literally now. <laughs> so what's the meaning of it today? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, it has multiple meanings. I think this is another word we I often hear complaints about. It means nothing anymore. It doesn't have meaning. We've used it. We've destroyed its meaning because we're using it in this different way. I do hear that a lot about literally. I think what really bothers people about literally is that the new meaning of literally, which means sort of figuratively, not literally, is the opposite of its original meaning, and that bothers people. But the reason literally has changed to have this additional aspect of meaning that means figuratively is because it is very typical in the history of English and all languages for words to shift in a figurative way hmm. for hyperbolic ex sort of um, extravagance to sort of point out something as being more than usual to point to things as being exceptional and the best way to make something seem exceptional is to new, use a word that is unexpected and contrary to its original meaning because that highlights that difference. And literally is a perfect example of this. And it follows the same path as words like very or really. Because if you look at the original word of very the, in Old English, or actually it wasn't part of Old English, it was part of Middle English, when it got borrowed from French, the French word vrai, which today in French is vrai, which means true, right? If I say c'est vrai, it means it's true. In old English, in Middle English, vrai meant true. And so you would see Jesus referred to as a vrai prophet, a true prophet. Or you'd see a reference to a man that was vrai in word and deed, true in word and deed. You didn't see it used in this hyperbolic sense that it's used today, like I'm very happy, I'm very cranky, I'm very angry. That wouldn't have been a use earlier on. Yeah. But what happens is we metaphorically extend this idea of of so, so complete it was true, so much, this idea of degree. If something is true, it has all aspects of this thing. So it's a very high degree of whatever you're describing as true. So that aspect of meaning that's just a very high degree gets extrapolated and figuratively extended so that the truth and the actual meaning of true and actual falls away and all that's left is extravagance or hyperbolic uh, amount or degree, and that's what happened to vary. Well, how do we use literally? We use it the same way. Literally also meant true or actual in this literal place, for example, um, or I wrote a literal translation of something, meaning a word-to-word -word translation, which is actually the original use of literal. It meant copying a text word for word. So using literal in any other sense other than relating to letters was already a figurative extension of the meaning of literal because its literal meaning is by the letter. That's its literal meaning. The word literate, a person of letters, that's from the same root, from the same Latin root. So that's already a figurative extension. But then what happened is just like what happened to Vary, the meaning of true or actual fell away, and all that was left was this hyperbolic extent, this figurative use of it to mean degree. And that's the same path we find for really. So this is a very current, a very um, kind of recurrent pattern that happens in English, and it's called semantic bleaching. I think the trick is with literally – it means the opposite of literal. So when I say something literally happened, I usually mean it actually happened. When I say I was literally starving, I'm not actually literally starving. I'm the opposite of literally starving. I'm just really hungry. And that's what I'm trying to convey. But if we think of a lot of other words, like the word hardly, if I say, oh, that was hardly a problem. The original meaning of hard was hard. <laughs> right. The, the, so, so when I say it was hardly a problem, meaning it wasn't a problem, it wasn't difficult. That's the opposite of the original meaning of hardly, which up to the 16th century meant, meant with great difficulty. Or if I say something like that's terrific, if I say, oh my gosh, that is terrific, that means that's good, right? I'm happy for you. But terrific is actually frightening or terrifying. That's the original meaning of terrific, which got semantically bleached to just mean when something is horrifying, it has a big impact on you. It's really shocking. And so good news is really shocking. So it metaphorically got extended to mean just, wow, impressive, shocking in a good way, which is the opposite of its original meaning. So I think if we start to think, well, gosh, I already do this. I'm very non-literal in my use of those other words, and that doesn't bother me. So why should I be so upset about people doing the exact same thing to the word literally? But that's the history of literally. It basically um, 
in, a, in a, about two or 300 years ago, we start to see it in literary works used non-literally. So Jane Austen, James Fenimore Cooper, and then a little later, F. Scott Fitzgerald, uh, Mark Twain, all used literally figuratively. So we're in very, very good company when we're using it in that way. Mark Twain, oh my God, is he also a degenerate? <laughs> <laughs> Well, he did a lot of wonderful things for language, right? He he definitely wrote, a, he, he really valorized writing in dialect, writing in colloquial English. Um, but his, where he used literally was actually not in dialect, uh, like we see in some of his works, Huckleberry Finn. It was actually in The Adventure, Adventures of Tom Sawyer, where he describes when Tom went out and worked and earned some money, by the end of the day, Tom was literally rolling in wealth. So where he used it was a figurative expression of all of a sudden he went from having no money to having a lot of money. Yeah. And it was not in dialect. It was actually in Mark Twain's voice as the narrator. Um, so it was really not used in a degenerative sense at all in that context. But yet we read that and no one gets upset over it, even though it, it was sort of also a figurative use of literally. Okay, so uh, there's one last topic I would like to ask you about. Um, because nowadays there are many people upset and annoyed at this, many of them, probably most of them are uh, political pundits. The use of a certain new or invented or, I mean, reusing already existing personal pronouns or giving them new uses and new meanings like they, them, z, zer, and uh, stuff like that. F uh, so, uh, I mean, I mentioned the political pundits because, uh, interestingly enough, uh, it really annoys me that <laughs> these people, they supposedly know about everything. So suddenly they turn into linguists <laughs> and they know everything about language and how language works and so on and about any other scientific topic out there. They are experts in everything. So since I have a linguist here in front of me, I would like to ask you, so is it really problematic at all if people are now giving these new uses to, for example, they, them, or asking people if, for example, they identify as non-binary or some other gender identity that they prefer to go by the personal pronouns they, them, or some other personal pronouns. Is that, from the perspective of scientific linguistics, problematic or not? From a linguistic standpoint, absolutely not, because the history of our pronouns is one of change. And I think people don't realize that, that English pronouns have changed drastically over the history of English. And if you look back at old English pronoun paradigms, you won't recognize most of them. Uh, for example, the pronoun she did not exist in Old English. We didn't get the pronoun she till about the 12th or 13th century. And it was driven by the social need of discerning whether you were talking about a he or a she back in Old English. You really couldn't do that because even though Old English had a way to note she from the masculine pronoun, it was a derivative of the masculine pronoun, because of sound changes that fell together. So did the pronoun for they, which was hail in Old English. Mm -hmm. It wasn't they, they was a borrowed pronoun. So those have drastically changed. The only pronoun of the third person pattern that exists today is he. She was new, they is new. So I think it's funny that people seem to get so upset over these changes. And also what happened to thou and thee? I mean, how many of us walk around and say, hey, Val, what's going on? None of us, not unless we're trying to be funny. So, you know, I think one thing we can remind ourselves of when we get upset about novel pronouns is that English has a history of novel pronouns and novel pronoun use. And at the times of a lot of those changes, people were upset over them. So if we look at the literature that we see talking about the shift from using thou and thee to using you and ye, people were upset. Grammarians were upset over it. Um, religious folks were upset over it. The Quakers really ra rallied against using you and ye instead of thou and thee. They, th they thought it was a sin against God. And if you think about the rhetoric today, 
we hear about using they as a, a singular pronoun, it's exactly the same rhetoric. It's not grammatical. It's uh, immoral. Well, we had the exact same discussions. I mean, the topic was different about why the change was happening. The social changes in the fabric of society were different. But when we switch from using thou and thee to using you and ye, and then further from using you and ye to just using you, it was socially driven changes. It was because the world was changing, society was changing, the world was becoming more democratic, middle class was rising, and the the difference between using a thou and a you or a, a thee and a, a you were based on very rigid differences in social class. And it was basically eradicating this really hierarchical social class structure. And it was to keep up with the changes in society happening. And then, then the complaints about it were that it was not grammatical. How dare you use that? It's not grammatical. And then the religious complaints about it being immoral. So we hear the exact same things today echoed about they. So I think it's really interesting if we could think about our history for a minute and understand that we survived that change. And all of us use you today with no problems. No one walks around and says, oh my God, is it a singular verb or a plural verb I should use with you? I just can't figure it out. No, everybody just uses the plural verb. You are, you are whether you're one person or you are whether you're five yous, right? Doesn't matter, plural verb. That was not how it was used in, old in, in, in uh, Middle English. It was used with a, a plural verb only. Um, and so when it switched to being single referent, we just kept that plural verb. So a lot of the complaints we have today is what verb should they be used with? Well, plural verb, same thing as you, but also the immoral or, you know, kind of um, against God sort of ideas that we have, again, are ones that I think have to do with more of societal dis-ease with the way that we're changing socially, the, the difference in our viewpoints about whether, how we feel about um, non-binary uh, existence and whether it should be something that's uh, appropriate. So I think what we need to separate is when we're complaining about people using these non-binary pronouns, instead of saying it's about language, because it's not, it's not an argument about language because language has done this over and over again. It's an argument about what we believe is socially appropriate and socially acceptable. And we should call it like it is. If I'm someone who doesn't believe that people should have non-binary pronouns, what I'm really saying is I don't believe that you should exist and be at least forthright enough to admit that really what you're doing is claiming that people shouldn't have a non-binary identity and then take the heat for that kind of viewpoint socially. But what they do instead is they convert it to be about the language so that they can, instead of seeming like they're not keeping up with societal changes, they can say, well, it's just against the language. It's not against, I'm not saying that I don't agree you have a right to exist. I'm saying you don't, I don't agree you to have a right to change this pronoun. But that isn't really what they're saying. What they're saying is, I don't believe you have a right to exist. And they're using the language as a cover for that discomfort with the societal change. And I think what we can do is look back in our history and understand that pronouns have always changed. Really, many, many of our pronouns are different than the way they were before. And not only that, but this idea for coming up with a, a neutral, um, non-gendered third-person pronoun, that idea of coming up with new words for it has existed for about 200 years. And over the last 200 years, we've had about 200 different propositions for what non-binary pronouns could be or what um, generic or non-specific pronouns could be. So I think that when some of the earliest ones were like nay and niz, and then there was thon, and then there was per, I mean, there've been all sorts of, of ones that have been recommended, but the reason they have survived is because it's really hard for one person to say, here's a new word, let's all adopt it, right? Because we have all these different factions, those people don't talk to these people, and everybody's gonna have a different idea on a new word that it should be. Uh, but when words arise to meet the needs of speakers in an organic fashion, where it just happens rather than any type of planning, that's where we tend to see language change be most successful. And they has been used for 700 years as a non-specific gender gender non-referencing pronoun. So, you know, we even find Chaucer using it in this way. There are cases where he uses it as an indefinite, to, with, in reference to an indefinite antecedent that could be singular or plural. I mean, sorry, that could be male or female. He uses they. So for example, it, it was whosos in old, in Middle English. You said whosos instead of whoever, but 
he actually has a line where he says whoever when he's referring to whoever, which yeah. would be a he if you want to be standard about it. Whoever wants to do this, he should go there. Well, Chaucer actually says whoever wants to do this, they should go there, basically. And he also has another phrase where he says every person uh, dance and sang, they dance and sang. Right, where it's not every person he danced and sang, it's every person they danced and sang. So we see this they mm -hmm. used in a non specific, non gendered way 700 years ago. And so it's just crept into the language in this way. And it solved our problem without us even having to think about it. So it just got adopted naturally to be used as a non-binary pronoun. It was a very natural choice. That's why it's been so successful. Uh, that And for that only that reason, because it's already there in the language. Whereas if we try to use a, a new pronoun, it just doesn't work. So that's why Z and Zer, even though it's used in some communities, it hasn't really taken wide set, widespread acceptance because it hasn't organically developed. And they organically developed. So my answer to those pundits that bring it up is you're really not arguing about the language you're arguing about the social changes that underlie the language and so you know you need to call a spade a spade in that case so uh, my last question then and sort of in in some ways related to my previous one so what do you think about uh, the contro the recent controversy surrounding the removal or pr the proposal of removing certain words or words with negative connotations from uh, classic works of fiction, for example, like the N-word and stuff like that. Do you think that that might be linguistically problematic in any way or not? Yes, I definitely don't agree with that because I think the okay. reality is words, words only have meaning in context. I mean, that's okay. the reality. And um, when we start, we, we lose an opportunity to talk about why those words are powerful, why those words are painful, why those words have come to mean the things they have when we just eradicate them. Because what we're, if we try, the, the thing that I think people don't understand is changing the language doesn't change the ideas. It doesn't mm -hmm. change the philosophy. It doesn't change the belief system. And that's the problem. The problem is the belief system, right? The problem is the ideologies that underpin those, those negative meanings. So removing the words doesn't change that. Removing the words just tries to render it invisible. And if it's invisible and we're not talking about it, we cannot make progress on understanding why we say those things. So for example, when my daughter was about 11, we read To Kill a Mockingbird together, the book. We read mm -hmm. it together. And it has a lot of language in there, right? It uses the N word, for example, and it has you know words like rape and things like that. Well, I didn't have her sit alone in a room and read it. We read it together at night and we discussed the meaning of those words and why they were powerful in negative ways and positive ways and various mm -hmm. things. So we used it as an opportunity to understand our history and to face ourselves and to understand why things were different and why we react negatively to them today and why that isn't a word we would want to use today. Yes. So I think taking it out doesn't change the necessity of having conversations about hard topics. Um, and I also believe that language encodes everybody's viewpoint. It's not progressive. It's it's just advancing. I think that's a better way. Language advances, but it's, it's not progressive in the sense that it's not representing only one viewpoint. It represents everyone's viewpoint. That's what language is. And so it offers us the opportunity to try to see other people's perspective or try to explain why those words exist and taking them out doesn't do anything. I, now, do I suggest we should be you know, telling our kids to write their stories in class with those words that might be a little more problematic, right? Because I'm not sure that that's the place for those conversations, but I just don't believe in banning words any more than I believe in banning books because they represent ideas we don't like.
Right. And also because I guess that in this particular case, uh, and it's basically the same with the use of they, them, I mean, it's not that words have intrinsic meanings to them. I, I, of course, now in our modern context, contemporary context, the N word, we shouldn't use it for the reasons we know, the negative connotations associated with it, but uh, I mean, it could have meant any other thing, right? Absolutely. And, you know, I think the reality is, I just think we give words more power than, than we, we probably should imagine that they have, because it's not words that have impact. It's people that have impact. It's people using those words in certain ways. So I don't believe that any word should not be mentioned, uh, as long as you understand its history and context. Um, I also don't agree that, I, you know, I also probably don't agree with the really far left kind of view that, um, we always have to be so that we should be eradicating words that they feel are wrong either. I think what we should do is open up conversations about them. I just don't believe that language itself has meaning. What I believe is that the users of language carry that meaning. And so it offers and invites conversation and we don't have to agree. We don't have to agree. I think that's the fundamental thing. In my book, I'm not asking anybody to like these features. I'm just saying you have to understand the history and have a conversation about it. But I'm not expecting people to come away from my book saying, yes, I love like now. I'm going to use it all the time. <laughs> I just want you to make sure you have both perspectives. And you can dislike things. I think that's totally appropriate. Whether you can call them bad is a totally different question because that's a moral judgment. And I just don't think we should make moral judgments about words. Um, what we should do is make have conversations about them instead. And not just the moral judgments, but also sometimes people make claims that are factually, scientifically incorrect about how language works, right? The majority of time, yes, because we don't know linguistics. We don't teach linguistics unless you've sought out a linguistics course. So most people don't understand the science of language. And so they espouse these views that they've been taught that are actually factually incorrect. Uh, so that was one of my goals is let's look at the history and, and that then you can draw your own conclusions once you know the history and you know the science. Great. So the book is again, like literally do the <laughs> arguing for the good and bad English. I'm leaving a link to it in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Friedland, just, be just before we go, apart from the book, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Oh, sure. Um, I do have a website. It's just ValerieFriedland.com. And uh, maybe you'll have that in your links as well. And there you can find out more about me, also my research, but um, some of the articles I've written and things. I also do a monthly blog on psychology today. And it's called Language in the Wild. So uh, if you're interested in you know, a variety of language topics, I cover them all in there. Uh, and that appears usually, uh, I do do it once a month, but usually it's on the first or second Sunday of the month. But you can also set it up so it notifies you. So I'd love to have people come look at some of those articles too if they're interested. Okay, so Dr. Friedland, like, dude, like, this was literally totally awesome. So thank you so much for coming Absolutely. on the show. Like later, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you liked it, please do not forget to like it, share, comment and subscribe. And if you like more generally what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show on Patreon or PayPal. You, get, you have all of the links in the description of this interview. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Pereira Larsen, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Visser, Adam Kessel, Matthew Whittingbur Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Henrik Alenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Kavanagh, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andreev, Francis Ford, Triago Duns, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Jonathan Leibrandt, John Linear, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, 
João Leira, Tam Amal, Sardas France, David Sloan Wilson, Yassi Ladez Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Stasevski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hallman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Panos Cortes, Ursula Litzke, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wisman, Morten Eichland, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, Jorge Stéphanos, Chris Williamson, Peter Olozen, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Eriksson, Charles Murray, Alex Shaw, Amory Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheists, Larry Dilley Jr., Holt Erickbun, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassi, Tom Roth, The RPMD, Igor N., Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Richard Bowen, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Manuel Oliveira, Kimberly Johnson, and Benjamin Galbart. A special thanks to my producers, these are Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Tom Vanegdam, Bernard Hugni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John, John Carlo Montenegro, Robert Lewis and Al Nick Ortiz, and to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all.